Jeremy De Silva, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your office in New Hampshire. You are a paleoanthropologist and associate professor in the anthropology department at Dartmouth College, specializing in the locomotion of the first apes as well as early human ancestors. You've recently released your first book, First Steps, How Walking Upright Made Us Human. And it's that unique journey that we're going to be talking about today. Now, People know you as Jerry, so I'm going to kick off the interview by asking, what has it been like, Jerry, to be a paleoanthropologist uh, in a pandemic? Did your work pattern change in any way in 2020? That's a great question, Mark. Um, I mean, it, it's been it's been hard. Uh, it's been it's been hard on on my colleagues and, and all of us as we have to, you know, very quickly shift how we teach, how we do research. Uh, there's been, you know, it was a, a backlog of work uh, that we could we could continue to catch up on. And so we have a, a paper in review right now on the basis of material that we collected at Lyotoli, the famous footprint print site in 2019. Mm. Um, but one of the exciting things that's, that's actually happening um, is, you know, I'll give you an example. This is a, this is a foot bone. Uh, it's a 3D printout of a foot bone that was found oh. in Africa. And so what my colleagues can do uh, who are still in South Africa collecting fossils is they can then 3D scan them and send me a digital file and I can print them out with a 3D printer and, and do some preliminary anatomical um, uh, yes. uh, descriptions of fossils. And so we can continue to do our work, um, but, but only if we have uh, that sort of partnership with colleagues uh, in these countries where we where we work, South Africa, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Kenya. Yeah, I've, I've spoken to quite a, a few people who've said that technology has really saved them during the pandemic. I think so. Yeah. Well, before we step into the world of human bipedality, let's just hear a little bit more about you. Jerry, did you always have a love of paleoanthropology and the question of why we stood upright? No, I, I, I didn't. Um, I mean, I've always loved science. He's in a, you know, as a little kid, I, I, I loved, uh, you know, finding, finding bugs and, you know, I, looking at the the craters of the moon through it through an old telescope that we got at a yard sale um but i i was much more interested in in um the physical sciences i went to college to study astronomy um and astrophysics is, was was sort of my passion as i as i you know went to college i never took an anthropology course uh, or a biological anthropology course in 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 college um i ended up getting a degree in biology and physiology um, I, instead of, you know, learning how galaxies work, I, I was learning how the cardiovascular system works. Um, mm. and when I finished college, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I love to write a, about science. I would, uh, write a, 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 column in the, in the, the university newspaper, uh, as an undergraduate each week, usually centered around, around science. Uh, but that first year out of college, I, uh, taught part-time at a science museum. And I completely fell in love with, with teaching uh, and informal science education. And I ended up working full time eventually at the Science Museum. Um, and it was at the Science Museum. It was, it was in Boston, the Boston Museum of Science. And it was there that I discovered my passion for paleoanthropology. We had a, a small exhibit on the famous Lyotoli footprints made by our bipedal ancestors three and a half million years ago. And these footprints were positioned a little too close to the dinosaur exhibit uh, in a way that might spread that misconception that uh, dinosaur <laughs> humans coexisted, right? And so I, I talked to my boss, uh, Lucy Kirshner, and I said, you know, why don't we move those footprints up to our human biology exhibit? And there we can use um, them as a, as a centerpiece to talk about human evolution. And she said, sure, but, but please, you know, go to the library and go learn everything you can about human evolution. Cause I didn't know anything about human evolution. Hmm. And so I pulled out books by Ian Tattersall and from Lucy to language by Don Johansson. Mm -hmm. uh, and I devoured these books and, and there, you know, there's an expression in our field that you caught the hominid bug. 
And that's exactly what happened to me. Um, I became pretty obsessed with these fossils and, and the stories that they tell, not only about um, our lineage and how we got to be the way we are, but, but the, you know, the stories that each, each individual fossil uh, tells. Uh, each fossil has a, has a discoverer and a discovery story. And then each fossil also is of an individual who lived, breathed, and, and, and laughed and cried and, and you know, ate and had kids probably and, and, then, and eventually died. And I thought it was just amazing the tools that these scientists could apply to squeeze information out of these ancient bones. Uh, and so I, I wanted to do it. Um, so I, I left the science museum and I joined uh, the, the graduate program of uh, the laboratory of uh, Laura McClatchy, who was at Boston University, and then eventually the University of Michigan. Um, and she studies the locomotion of early apes. Um, and so that's how I started thinking about and getting very interested mm -hmm. in uh, how our ancient ape ancestors, and then eventually our ancient hominin ancestors, um, how they moved around their world. I was thinking back to those footprints in the museum, huh? Yes, yeah, and, and you know the story has come full circle because in 2019 uh, I I went to Laetoli and spent some time um, excavating uh, some some additional footprints uh, at that site, and it was so special to 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 be there. It's an extraordinary extraordinary site, not only historically speaking for our field, uh, but the information that is preserved uh, it, 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 at the site is just it, it's it's stunning. Jerry, can you begin by giving us an overview of the hominins that we know were upright walkers and how far back that they go? That's a great question, Mark. Um, so we, we as, as anthropologists, are very interested in um, the characteristics of humans that we share with our close living relatives, the chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, and the things that are unique to us. Um, we have large brains, we have language, creativity, uh, heavy reliance on technology. We have small canine teeth uh, and we move on two legs. And it's the fossil record that helps us figure out the order in which those things happen. Uh, did they all happen sort of in concert or did uh, the human evolution unfold in more of a mosaic pattern where certain features evolved earlier than others? And it turns out that the, the latter scenario that I just laid out is, is exactly how human evolution unfolded. Uh, and, and the earliest features that we find is as we go back in time to the common ancestor that we share with chimpanzees and bonobos that lived about six or seven million years ago, what we find as we go back in time is that these early, early ancestors of ours uh, could move at least occasionally on two legs. It's one of the most ancient features that defines the human lineage. It's, it's not the large brain that comes later. It's not uh, a reliance on technology that comes later. It's not language or art that comes later. Um, it's walking on, on two legs. Hmm. And so as we go back to those, those early, early, early uh, hominin ancestors of ours, such as Sahelanthropus chadensis from, from the country mm -hmm. of Chad, it's about 7 million years old. And there's, there's tantalizing evidence from the base of the skull that this creature would have held itself in an upright posture. There's a femur, there's a leg bone from Kenya that's about 6 million years old from a species known as Auroran tugenensis. And it has many of the hallmarks of an upright walking uh, uh, creature uh, like, like, like us. Um, and then there's this, this tiny little toe bone from Ethiopia mm -hmm. Uh, from Artipithecus cadaba, almost six million years old, about five and a half million years old. And it too has some of the key anatomies uh, for pushing off the ground if you're moving on, on two legs. And so it doesn't look like much, a toe bone, a femur, and a skull, but each of these pieces we have um, reveal this really interesting story that, that one of the first things that would have changed as our lineage got uh, uh, be split from the one that, that was heading off to chimpanzees and bonobos uh, was the way we move uh, on, on, on two legs.
Now, these early, early hominin ancestors, Sahelanthropus, Auroran, Artipithecus, um, they weren't walking on two legs like, like we do. Uh, they also have anatomies of, of what we know about their arms and their fingers, uh, that they were excellent tree climbers, and they probably spent most of their time in the trees. But when they came down from the trees, how did they then move from point A to, to, to point B? Did they, did they knuckle walk? And it appears the answer is no. Uh, the, that the anatomy that they that they've evolved in their in their hips and what we know about their uh, uh, what little we know about their their feet uh, is that they probably moved uh, again bipedally moved on 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 two legs again not the way we do uh, probably a less efficient way of moving on two legs but mm -hmm. uh, but we're getting the the beginnings of of upright walking on the ground. Uh, in in these early early uh, hominins, but there's so much we still don't know about them, um, and researchers are out there searching for more fossils to help us, uh, you know, pull back the shades on this on this really uncertain time period when we know our lineage was beginning to take root uh, to try to understand better uh, what the anatomy, uh, the behavior of these early hominins was and the ecological circumstances in which uh, bipedalism was evolving. It's something we still don't really have a good handle on. And I think one of the earliest ones is called uh, Denuvius, isn't that right? So, yeah, so Denuvius is a fascinating uh, new discovery from, from Germany that takes us back even farther. So we know that humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor that lived six or seven million years ago, and then gorillas come into that mix uh, eight, nine million years ago. And so the common ancestor of all of the African great apes probably lived around that time period, you know, eight, nine, 10 million years ago. But what, what about farther back than that? What about 11 million, 12 million years ago? Well, at that time period, the apes were not confined to Africa. And instead, there were forests that expanded all the way around the Mediterranean, what was at the time called uh, what we call the Tethys Sea. And so there are ape fossils in France and Spain and Greece and Italy and Hungary and Turkey and even and even Germany. It's such an interesting thing to think about um, apes living in southern Europe. But that's where we find lots and lots and lots of uh, fossils of apes at that time period. Uh, and one of the really, really interesting ones was just discovered by Madeleine Burma, uh, who's a paleontologist in, in, at the University of Tübingen in, in Germany. Um, and she found at a quarry, a clay quarry site called Hammerschmied, she found uh, an ape skeleton, partial skeleton, and it looks like it has long arms and curved fingers. It looks like it's up in the trees, but in the trees, it looks like it's standing up in the trees and moving with what we would call hand-assisted uh, uh, bipedalism, that it might be walking in the trees, not terribly different uh, maybe a little different, but not too different from what you see in an orangutan or in a gibbon who can move in the in the trees on on two yes. legs. So it raises the possibility that the common ancestor that all the African apes share together uh, was actually more upright than the uh, the cartoon version of human evolution would have us think. Mm. You've, you've seen that image, right, on a T-shirt or a coffee cup or a bumper sticker of the chimpanzee slowly turning into the human. And the fossils that we're finding show that not only is that a gross oversimplification, it was much more complicated and frankly much more interesting than that, um, but that the common ancestor may not have even walked on its knuckles. It may have been something that was more upright to begin with, and then bipedalism on the ground evolve from that. So upright walking in that case wouldn't be a new form of locomotion. It would be an old form of locomotion just in a new setting on the ground rather than up in the trees. And if that turns out to be the case, we're, we're still trying to figure this out. This is one of these um, contentious topic in our field right now. We're, we're, we're sort of split as a discipline uh, about that, that body form of the common ancestor. But if this turns out to be the case, then what we need to do is sort of flip the question and ask, well, why did knuckle walking evolve? That knuckle walking in chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas in that case 
would end up being more derived. It would end up being a form of locomotion that would have evolved more recently. So we'll see. We'll see as we begin to unpack that question by studying the comparative anatomy of the apes living today, the behavior of the apes living today, but really what we're going to need to address this question are fossils from that, that mysterious time period that we really don't know much about of seven, eight, nine, ten million years ago. Well, standing upright was a key innovation in our hominin ancestors that set our species off, but the answers to when and why are still quite elusive. So I guess the question we have to dive into right away is what possible advantage would it have been for our possible knuckle walking ancestors to have stood up? Uh, we still don't know. I mean, it, the honest answer is, is we don't know. And to me, that's exciting. It's exciting as a scientist to have a, a mystery, to have a question that we don't have an answer to yet. Uh, it means, you know, we've, we've got work to do uh, and, and data to collect and hypotheses to test. Um, but look, Mark, there are a lot of hypotheses that have been put out there as to why bipedalism evolved. Why was this an advantageous form of locomotion? And it goes all the way back uh, to, to Linnaeus, you know, back long before Darwin. Linnaeus thought that humans evolved well, he wasn't using the term evolve, mm. but that humans um, had an advantage uh, moving on two legs to see over tall grass, uh, that we would have stood up to see over tall grass and look for, for predators. Um, but the problem with that idea is if you spot a predator, if you spot a lion, the worst thing you can do is run away on two legs. Moving on two mm. legs, yeah. it, it makes us incredibly slow compared to a quadrupedal animal. We're one of the slowest mammals on earth. The fastest human among us, Usain Bolt, the fastest he ever ran was 28 miles per hour, which is about 40 kilometers per hour or so. Um, that is half the speed of a galloping zebra or antelope, or more importantly, half the speed of a galloping leopard or lion. So if you want to get away from a predator, you, you, you'd want to do it on all fours hmm. if speed mattered. Um, so Darwin, in, in uh, Descent of Man in 1871, 150 years ago now, uh, he proposed that uh, bipedalism evolved to free the hands uh, for stone tools, uh, to use those stone tools um, as, as weapons or as a means to, to, gather, to gather food. And so we can test that idea. Darwin always proposed testable hypotheses. We can test this by looking at the timing of the onset of walking and the timing of the first stone tools. Um, and there's a huge gap. Yeah. So upright walking seems to be evolving five, six, seven million years ago. And stone tools don't show up in the record until about the oldest ones we have now are 3.3 million years old. So there is a you know, three million year gap. And yeah. so that, that hypothesis is somewhat, somewhat problematic. Um, if it's, attempting to explain the origin of, of bipedal locomotion. Other hypotheses that have emerged have to do with the energetic efficiency of walking. We're not fast, but we don't burn a lot of fuel walking on two legs. We're very energetically efficient. So maybe as our ancestors were moving from point A to point B on their landscape, um, moving on two legs, those individuals who happened to move on two legs, uh, they uh, didn't burn as much fuel and they could survive uh, periods of, of drought uh, or times when there wasn't, wasn't much in the landscape, um, and those individuals could survive those times and, and reproduce. Um, others have proposed that this is about thermoregulation, that moving on two legs exposes less of your body, surface area of your body, to an equatorial sun. And maybe then you can cool off more efficiently. Um, lots and lots and lots of hypotheses. There are so many. Um, uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to bore your listeners <laughs> with all of them. Um, but the the honest answer is we don't know. Um, you'll hear from folks um, certainty that they do know why we evolved bipedal locomotion. Um, but you should you should hear those uh, those th that certainty with some skepticism because. You know, I've been studying this for 15 years. I've read through all the literature. I've been out there collecting the data. And we don't know why bipedalism evolved. And I would argue that it's a fool's errand to try to identify the one reason. 
uh, that most likely there were multiple reasons why mm. bipedalism might have been selectively advantageous to our ancestors, you know, freeing the hands to carry food, to carry babies, um, and, and maybe perishable tools that don't show up in the, in the fossil record. There are ideas about intimidation, standing on two legs to make yourself look larger. And you and, must tell my listeners about the trench coat hypothesis, because that's I oh, love no. the name of that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is an idea uh, that was proposed in the 1970s, uh, that this was about um, uh, it, uh, showing off your your the front of your body, showing off your genitalia. Um, now, here's an example of an idea uh, that that hey, might it be true? I guess, but how in the world could we ever know that? What evidence would you gather? What what would the fossils need to look like for you to scientifically evaluate that hypothesis? And so a lot of these origin hypotheses are framed in a way that they cherry pick the data and they come up with some idea of why bipedalism evolved. Um, and then you can't test it with the evidence that we currently, we currently have. And therefore you can't refute it as a scientific hypothesis yeah. and, it, and it remains as a possibility. It's, it's almost philosophical, isn't it? That's exactly right. And so what I implore my colleagues to do is, is if you want to propose a scientific hypothesis for why bipedalism evolved, go for it. Just make sure that you frame it in a way that it has testable predictions. That this is what the fossil should look like, or this is what some genetic sequence should look like, or this is what uh, we should see as we look at other animals on the landscape uh, or other ecologies in which our ancestors were, were, were living with modern models, what would we expect to find? And if we don't find that, then you refute the hypothesis, which is how scientists operate. Mm. Um, we, we, we really you know, can't pitch an idea and, and, then, and then hold it close to our heart. Uh, we have to be willing to give up on our ideas if the evidence uh, implores us to do so. Um, and so again, I emphasize that we don't know why bipedalism evolved. Mm. I'm not sure. There's a colleague of mine who thinks we, we may never be able to know, in part because there aren't other upright walking mammals uh, that we can use as models to try to understand the human condition. There are mammals that will occasionally move on two legs, bears and chimpanzees and gorillas, and so researchers have explored the circumstances under which they do that, um, but uh, it hasn't quite gotten us to where we where we want to be. Um, I really think the fossils are going to be the things that are going to allow us to test some of these hypotheses, um, and we don't have them yet. We don't have the fossils from seven, eight, nine, ten million years ago, sort of the before and after fossils. Uh, to know what were the changes that happened and what were the ecological circumstances in which our ancestors were evolving uh, terrestrial bipedal locomotion. We still don't really have a handle on that. Well, a good way to study possible bipedalism in a creature is to study the shape of the bones. Now, you've worked on several well-known hominids, including Australopithecus sediba, and Homo naledi. In fact, one of my earliest guests was Matthew Berger, who found Sediba back in 2008. So what did your work on these remarkable specimens reveal? So when I was initially studying the foot and, and ankle and leg of, of Australopithecus, which is a, a group of early hominins that lived from roughly two to four million years ago, and are the first that, that really evolved the human-like adaptations for committed terrestrial bipedalism. Mm. If you go back before that to the origins of bipedalism, what we've been talking about, um, these were hominins that were still well adapted for life in the trees. Uh, and then around 4 million years ago, you start to find anatomies that are much more human-like in skeletons like Lucy. Um, and, and, and she's not the only one. There are many, many, many fossils that were found from her species, but then she's not even, even the only species of Australopithecus. There are upwards of, of 10 to 12 different kinds of, of Australopithecus that have, have been discovered. And initially, my uh, interpretation of those bones was that these were, these were excellent upright walkers, 
Um, at night, they would flee to the trees because where else are you going to sleep and, and not get eaten? Um, but that during the day, uh, they would spend most of their time on the ground. And that's because the shapes of their bones are so similar to the shapes of, of our bones mm -hmm. in ways that are biomechanically linked to walking. And so I was convinced that these were these were excellent upright walkers and that they all walked more or less in the in the same kind of way. Um, OK, <laughs> and then enter Matthew Berger. Um, Matthew, uh, as, as your, your listeners may know, uh, he was in, at the time nine years old. He was with his dad, Lee Berger, a paleoanthropologist who was exploring an area of South Africa known as the Cradle of Humankind. And Lee had been using Google Earth in order to explore this area and identified many spots that looked uh, uh, like they, they might be promising cave sites or fissures in the ground uh, where we know fossils accumulate or have accumulated over time in, in South Africa. Um, they arrived at an area uh, that's now known as Malapa, Malapa Cave. And Lee said, hey, Matthew, go off and find some fossils. So Matthew went running off and he tripped over a rock and he picked up the rock. And sure enough, there was a fossil sticking out of it. And he said, hey, dad, I found a fossil. And his dad came over, assuming it was an antelope or a zebra or a very common yeah. fossil we would find in that locality. Um, but instead, what was sticking out of that rock was a collarbone. And it was a collarbone from an early hominin. And if there was any doubt, when Lee turned the rock and looked on the other side, there was a lower jaw with a canine tooth. And the canine is distinctly small and blunt in humans and human ancestors. And so right there at that moment, uh, an extraordinary discovery had been had been made. And he knew a lot about clavicles, didn't he? That's right, because Lee, Lee had done his, his PhD uh, uh, dissertation on, on the shoulder girdle. Uh, and so he, he knew how to you know, recognize that, that, that shape. Um, over my shoulder right here, um, this is what ultimately was discovered at that site. Uh, was a remarkable, remarkably complete skeleton of an adult uh, and a second skeleton of, of a juvenile, including the skull of, uh, of a juvenile uh, individual. And so the question then is, in an, in an individual, what? What is this thing? Yeah. And so the research team uh, did a head-to-toe analysis of the skeleton, and they decided that this was a new species they called Australopithecus sediba. Now, I was brought onto the project around that time in order to analyze the foot bones and the leg of this creature. And I had just finished my thesis and I had just concluded that Australopithecus was a pretty good upright walker. Um, and, and, and Australopithecus was essentially the same no matter where it was or what it was. And uh, so to my shock, to my surprise, when I started working on these fossils, they didn't look like they were supposed to. The, the heel was way too ape-like. It didn't look like the heel of other Australopithecus that, that we had. The ankle was also different, in some ways more human-like, in some ways less human-like. The knee was bizarre. The knee was entirely different from what I would have expected as well. Uh, the pelvis is, has unusual morphologies. The lower back has unusual morphologies as well. And our first instinct as a field when we find something that's weird is to assume it's pathological. And the beauty of this discovery is that we had two and actually three individuals represented at the site, two partial skeletons and then there are bits of a third individual. Um, and they all look the same. So this wasn't some pathology. This was what these, this population looked like. Um, and in isolation, each of the bits of bone were strange, but in combination, they actually made sense. And I worked with a podiatrist, a former podiatrist, uh, who's now a paleoanthropologist, mm -hmm. Bern Zipfel, uh, and then worked with a physical therapist as well. And we tried to piece together how all of these unusual anatomies would work in concert with one another in a living, breathing hominin. Uh, and what we've concluded is that this species walked in an unusual way, what we would call hyperpronation. Some humans walk this way today, and the humans that walk this way today have problems with their feet and their knees and their hips and their backs. And what we saw in these skeletons were anatomical solutions to the very problems that humans have if they walk this way. 
So I think this species was adapted to moving in this particular fashion. So here are the lessons from, the, from this species. Why was it adapted to move this way? I think it was because this species spent a lot of time up in the trees. So here we have an Australopithecus that, that is different from the way that I concluded earlier in my career, Australopithecus moved. It walked in an unusual way and it spent much more time up in, uh, up in the trees. And the, 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 the big, I think the really fun discovery of, and, the, and the, the realization for me of this find is that different hominins at different times throughout human evolution walked in different ways. Wow. That you had out on the landscape different species moving on two legs, but not all in the same way. Moving in biomechanically distinct manners, depending on the local ecologies in which they were living and evolving. And so this is now... Um, uh, become a hypothesis that we've been able to test looking further back in time and even more recently in time. And again, what we find is bipedal variation through time. And so there was never just one way to walk. So again, that image that your listeners and your, your viewers have of the chimp slowly turning into the human would assume that at any one time in history, there was just one way to walk. Nope. It's much more uh, complicated than that lots of different species walking in different ways throughout human evolution. Like we were figuring it out. Kind of, yeah. All this sort of experimentation going on. Um, and that's how I sort of think about evolution uh, through natural selection um, is, is tinkering and, and, and slow little modifications happening here, happening there, uh, and, and you know, evolving adaptations for your local micro habitat um, and look, most of those probably didn't make it. Most of those were failed experiments and they went extinct. Or there could have been populations that then got reabsorbed genetically through interbreeding into some main line. Uh, and, and, then, and then those uh, uh, adaptations, uh, I, I'm not even sure if I would call them adaptations, those, those idiosyncrasies of the anatomy and of the biomechanics of walking would then get sort of dissipated um, and eventually uh, diluted in the gene pool and, and would vanish. So obviously the other find by Lieberg or Naledi, Homo Naledi, that walked in a different way, the two Sadib, obviously. It did, it did. And with Homo Naledi, um, what an amazing, amazing set of fossils that, that I, I feel so fortunate to, to have worked on, um, just in terms of, of volume. And so usually when I work on, on a, you know, a set of fossils. I'll go to South Africa and I'll say, okay, I want to look at all of the ankles. And what I, what is brought to me, you know, of all of human history throughout, throughout the last, you know, several millions of years uh, for ankles, uh, I'll have, I'll have 12 of them in front of me and I'll spend two weeks working on them uh, and describing them and, 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 and measuring them and taking 3d scans of them. Okay. With Homo naledi, that discovery and the excavation of those fossils um, essentially doubled the entirety of the African human fossil record. We had several hundred uh, foot bones from Homo naledi. So it was an overwhelming task to work on that material. Uh, thankfully, we had a very large group that worked on, on this material. Uh, lots of young scientists who were, who were quite hungry mm -hmm to work on a new project and to apply data sets and fresh ideas and fresh approaches on the basis of their, their legs and their feet. Um, they're much more human, like they're much more like us than, than in Australopithecus. Um, but they still were different in these interesting ways. They had relatively flat feet. We think um, uh, by putting their foot bones together, they look pretty flat. Um, they have relatively small joints. So they need long legs, but really small joints. So the hypothesis we have generated on the basis of that is that they could walk on two legs in an efficient way. They don't burn much fuel, but they don't have the endurance to walk on two legs for great distances. You need bigger joints for that to absorb those forces of impact. And they don't have that. So I think that's telling us that they had relatively small home ranges um, and they didn't, they didn't go very far uh, on, their, on their landscape. We'll, we'll see as we have more evidence for 
uh, what they were eating and how they were using their uh, their landscape. But but again, this comes back to this idea of many ways of walking, because the surprising thing about Homo naledi, given its anatomy, was that they lived very recently. On the basis of their anatomy, I thought they probably lived about two million years ago, and I was dead wrong. I was off by by uh, by a factor of ten. They only lived about a quarter of a million years ago, 250,000 years ago or, or so. And so they shared the African continent with Homo sapiens, with our own species. Our own species had evolved by then. And so you have Homo naledi uh, in South Africa, Homo sapiens. Uh, in Europe at this time were Neanderthals. In Asia at this time, were uh, a population we know mostly from genetic material extracted out of just a few fragmentary fossils known as the Denisovans. And then in Indonesia and the Philippines, we have uh, fossil evidence of two very small bodied uh, hominins that are sometimes nicknamed hobbits. And so the, the world a quarter of a million years ago was very different from it is, you know, the way it is now. Now there's one species of upright walking ape. But even at the dawn of our own species, it wasn't that way. There were these different populations and different even species of hominin. And right, they were walking in slightly different ways. Uh, Naledi walking a lot like us, but not far distances. Uh, Neanderthals looked like they had uh, more um, ability to sprint over short distances and maybe more side to side uh, movements on a, on, a, on, a, on a rough terrain. Uh, although they lived in many different habitats. Mm. Uh, in Homo floresiensis, uh, the hobbit in, in Indonesia has very large feet and short legs and a short body. And so maybe it would have, um, some, have some have proposed that maybe it would have walked like uh, somebody wearing uh, big uh, flippers or, mm. or, or snowshoes, that it would have had more of a knee kick uh, and, and, uh, and, and lift its leg up a little higher to prevent toe drag. Um, we're still not sure on that one. It'd be great to get some footprints from that species. And I know Matthew, has, uh, he said that they're still finding fossils in the uh, is the Denaledi cave where Naledi was found, even now. That's right. That's right. And and they're still finding fossils at Malapa Cave where, where Australopithecus oh. sediba was found. So fossils are still being pulled out of both caves, cave localities. And then, and then of course, uh, Lee Berger um, has found another another extraordinary cave site um, that's called the 105 site uh, and has been posting videos to his YouTube channel called the Fossil Vault. Uh, so your, your, your viewers can, can tune into that. Um, and he uh, is, is sort of taking you through the process of the discovery of, an, of a new fossil site. And here we go again. Huh? Here, here we go again. Here we go again. And, and you know, from what I've seen so far, um, it, it's going to, it's again, a, a pretty exciting, it's going to be an exciting new discovery. You also made a trip to Laetoli in Tanzania in 2019 to look at the wonderful hominin footprints left in the fossilized ash there. So what was that experience like for you? And did it enlighten you any further as to the story of how our ancestors walked? Uh, it was, it was amazing, Mark. Um, Laetoli is, is, is one of these um, historically uh, important um, sites in, our, in the history of our field. Uh, for, you know, for those who, aren't, who don't know, in the 1970s, um, uh, Mary Leakey led an expedition to Laetoli to search for, for fossil remains. Um, and then quite, quite famously, uh, there was an elephant dung fight that broke out among the researchers. Um, they started throwing <laughs> elephant dung at each other. And um, Kay Berensmeyer and Andrew Hill jumped down into a gully uh, to avoid getting hit. And down in the gully, what they noticed were impressions into a layer of volcanic ash uh, that were fossilized footprints. And so they stopped the game of elephant dung frisbee uh, and everyone came over and they started clearing the area. Um, and ultimately uh, thousands and thousands of footprints were discovered of um, uh, rhinoceros and ancestors of elephants and giraffes and and zebra, uh, even even little insect prints made through the ash, fossilized raindrops. 
uh, preserved in the ash. Uh, just an, an amazing snapshot uh, in, in time. Uh, and, and ash can be radioactively dated. And this site was dated to 3.66 million years old. Uh, so just under 3.7 million years old, which is around the time when Lucy species was around. Uh, Lucy herself is about 400,000 years younger than that, um, but her species is known from that time period, and in fact, uh, known from that site. And so eventually, uh, Mary Leakey's team discovered uh, fossilized footprints made by something moving on, on two legs, made by our ancestors, made by Australopithecus, uh, in this just beautiful uh, trackway made by two individuals walking in parallel, and then we think a third individual walking in the prints of another. Uh, and so those prints are quite are quite sloppy uh, because they, they are duplicate prints, one on top yes. of, of the other. Um, researchers have been studying these for decades now. They look like they were made by something walking a lot like us, but not exactly like us. Uh, the arch would have been a little lower, we think, the transfer of weight to the big toe wouldn't wouldn't have been quite as human-like. Uh, there's a researcher, Kevin Hatala, at Chatham University, who's done some beautiful work showing that um, that the kinematics of walking, how they extended their hips, might have been a little different uh, than what we see in, in, in humans today. So there are these subtle differences in gait, but for the most part, the, again, these are subtle. So if you could see an Australopithecus uh, mm. like Lucy at a distance walking across the landscape, you wouldn't be able to tell it wasn't a human. It would be walking a lot like us. And what I love about footprints, um, you know, look, I, I work on I work on fossils, and and fossils are the 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 evidence, yes, of life, but they also very much are capturing death. Um, you know, an individual died, and, and that's why we have, have their bones. They died in a place where their bones could be preserved and not, and not decay. Um, footprints capture life. They capture this moment in the life of an individual. And, yeah, you're not getting the, 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 the full uh, sort of, you know, record of the, of the lifespan of the individual that a fossil might be able to do for you but you're getting something with much higher resolution, uh, but a, a moment in time in the life of that individual. And so I love fossil footprints. I think they, they, they can tell us these incredible stories, not only of anatomy and of, of sort of the mechanics of say walking, but even, even behavior. Uh, so for instance, uh, at that famous trackway, um, one of the individuals is walking with, um, with her foot, uh, we, it might be a her, with her foot angled in a peculiar way. And it's consistent with, I think, with a limp, walking with an injury. Uh, and so here she is sort of hobbling along, and another individual, the other individual is walking right with her. Um, and so to me, this is, this is uh, a moment of, uh, of, of care and empathy and compassion. Um, now, am I reading too much into those prints? Maybe. But we also have fossil evidence. For instance, this is a fossil from Kenya of, of a, a femur um, of an upright walker, lived about 2 million years ago, mm -hmm. and it has a healed fracture of, of, of the wow. femur. Now, 2 million years ago, there are no hospitals. There are no doctors. If you break your femur on a landscape full of predators, you shouldn't make it through the night. There's, there's, there's no way that you yeah. should survive that. And yet, Mark, this is a healed fracture. So this individual did survive. They made did it. Did someone take care of them or? I think so. I, so, and again, these aren't just, this isn't the only example of this. We've got lots and lots and lots of examples of broken ankles, healed fractured femurs, terribly sprained ankles to the point that they, they leave a, a mark on the bone. Um, I think our ancestors living on this really difficult to survive landscape moving in a way that makes them incredibly slow, how, how do they not just go extinct? Um, mm -hmm. I think sociality and care and compassion and empathy were necessary ingredients for the survival of, of our ancestors. And we see it not only in the bones, but we see it in the fossilized footprints as well. So empathy could have gone right back to afarensis and beyond. 
I think so. I think so. And you know, and the other thing with that forensis is that um, we have we have the the Lucy partial skeleton that preserves a pelvis, and with a pelvis, you can um, simulate what childbirth would be like in, in the pelvis. And with the pelvis of Lucy, what we've been able to to find um, is that the baby would have had to have rotated to exit the birth canal. Um, and that's what happens in most human births. It's not what happens in most ape births. And the baby rotating or corkscrewing through the birth canal uh, causes the, the head of the baby to face backwards. And so um, in most primates, they just reach down and assist with their own birth. And they can do that because the baby is looking up at them as it's being born. But in humans, we have helpers during, yeah. during birth. Um, we have midwives, usually experienced women, assisting in, in birth. Um, and I think that the geometry of the afarensis pelvis uh, is shaped in a way um, that it's, again, telling us this story that afarensis would have benefited from and therefore I think may have had uh, midwifery uh, as well, helpers. Um, so they would assist each other during birth. I think they would assist each other with childcare. Um, and uh, and then right assist each other in times of need if if they're if they're injured, and that just carries on throughout time. And look, we we still do it today. You know, we can be awful to each other. We know that. Um, what we don't always appreciate uh, is uh, are, are the 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 simple gestures of kindness that that we exhibit on a daily basis to one another, uh, even to complete strangers. That's a really good point. So fascinating, Jerry. When you consider all of the things and think about all of the research that you've done what is the one thing that you would love to see pop up in the fossil world that would really shine a light on our past i love that question um <laughs> i want to see a a lucy for chimpanzees um when we are when we're trying to figure out our evolutionary history um we we can we can trace you know, the sort of the, the, the big picture of human evolution, um, we can lay out because we have thousands of fossils of our ancestors. I'm surrounded by them right now, right? We have so many fossils. Now, that doesn't mean we have it all figured out. There are lots mm -hmm. of things we're still discovering and lots of surprises. Um, we don't have a good fossil record for chimpanzees. So we don't know what a, a chimpanzee ancestor three million years ago looked like. So what do we do? as researchers, as a substitute for that, is we just put in a modern chimpanzee. And that's pretty wrongheaded. Um, now, now, maybe, maybe they haven't changed in three million years. That mm -hmm. can happen. There can be yeah. stasis established um, in, a, in a lineage. I doubt it, though. I bet they've changed quite a bit. Um, we don't have a good fossil record for, for gorillas either. Uh, and so my wish list would be a Lucy for chimpanzees, meaning a partial skeleton of something that is on the chimpanzee lineage uh, from three, four, you know, or so, five million years ago. As you go back farther than that to the common ancestor, it's going to be harder and harder and harder to know whether the thing you found is on the human lineage, on the chimp lineage, or on some side branch lineage that went extinct. And so, so that's going to become more difficult. Um, unless we have some of those intermediate steps uh, over the evolutionary history of chimpanzees, gorillas. But let's start with chimpanzees. Um, so that would be my, my, my wish list for future paleoanthropologists uh, is let's find some, let's find some fossil apes um, and, and get a better handle on what their evolutionary history was like, because that's going to help us interpret uh, those early uh, human fossils and put them in some context of what was the body form from which our lineage sprung? Was it something walking on its knuckles or was it something more, more upright? But look, Mark, you know, I am open to whatever it is that uh, our, our paleoanthropology colleagues are going to, are going to discover because 15 years ago, you know, when I was in, in, in grad school um, and, you know, even 20 years ago when I first sort of started uh, in, in all this, I think we as a field thought we kind of had the big picture figured out. Um, and then Artipithecus ramidus, Homo floresiensis, Australopithecus sediba, Homo naledi, all these fossils, the Denisovans, all these fossils that I don't think any of us would have predicted. 
And here they are just in the last couple of decades landing at our feet, forcing us as scientists to reevaluate and reconsider uh, some of the some of the holy grail ideas of our of our science. And and that's great. That that's 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 healthy for a scientific discipline to be challenged by new discoveries and new evidence. And so I am so excited for what the future is going to hold for our science. I think uh, with 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 fresh new discoveries and new scientists with with fresh eyes looking at this material, um, they're you know we're, we're we're just scratching the surface in terms of what we're going to reveal about ourselves in the coming decades. And thinking back to the uh, the people who were having the the dung fight, uh, you never know when you're going to find something, and that's usually when they are found. Exactly. I mean, right. Matthew Berger running off and tripping over a rock. Um, mm -hmm. Even Homo naledi was discovered by, it was discovered accidentally by spelunkers. Amateur, yeah. Amateur spelunkers, you know, and I tell my students all the time, look, imagine if Matthew Berger had tripped over that rock and then kept going. Or if those two spelunkers looked at the tiny little crevice that it takes to get down into the chamber where all the Homo naledi fossils are. And they said, eh, not today, let's go home and watch some TV. If those two things had happened, we wouldn't know about Australopithecus sediba, we wouldn't know about Homo naledi, but those bones would still be there, oh. right? So imagine how many things must still be out there just waiting to be discovered. There must be so much out there just under our nose waiting, waiting to be found. Um, Some will never be discovered. That's, that's oh, the awful thing. <laughs> oh, you're killing me, Mark. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Your book, First Steps, is out now. Uh, what was the impetus to write this book? And what can people expect when they dive into its pages? So I, um, as, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I started my career at the Boston Museum of Science. And I loved, loved, loved um, communicating with visitors about science, about the nature of science, about what we know and how we know it. Um, I, I so enjoyed that. Um, and I love teaching. Uh, and I also love writing. But scientific writing is very different uh, from the kind of, you know, writing that, that, I, that I used to enjoy. Uh, it's jargon filled. Um, and, you know, very few uh, uh, colleagues end up reading, you know, the papers you write. Um, I wanted to write something uh, for the general public. I wanted to rediscover my, my roots as a science educator. Um, and so I wanted to write something about the things I'm excited about. I wanted to write some, a book about uh, the origins and evolution of, of upright walking, um, which when I talked to folks about it, when I gave public lectures, when I talked to my students about it, um, that look, you walk around every day and, and you take it for granted. Um, you don't really think about how extraordinary walking actually, actually is and how it laid the foundation for all of the other things that we celebrate um, as, as human. You know, we even use the word pedestrian to describe something ordinary. Mm. So we don't think about how extraordinary it actually, it actually is. Um, and so I saw an opportunity here to, to write a book uh, for the general public that looked at the, the, the story of human evolution as we currently know it through the fossil record and through uh, comparative anatomy and genetics and behavior, uh, but through this lens of, of upright walking. Um, and again, to rediscover that museum educator voice that I used to have uh, so that I could, I could you know, try to communicate how cool I think this is uh, to a to a broader to a broader audience. And so I didn't write this book for my colleagues. Um, I wrote this book for for folks who know about Lucy and maybe know about the Lyotoli footprints, but really haven't thought about human evolution for a long time. There have been so many discoveries that have been made in the last few years that have forced us to really reevaluate what we thought we we knew. Um, so, Mark, I, I so enjoyed writing this book. Um, it was it was an absolute joy. Um, I'm, I'm you know I got an email this morning from a from a reader in, in California um, that just just warmed my heart. That they wow. they love the book. I'm getting emails from folks that are telling me I'm wrong about certain things in the book, and that's fine too. We can you know have that that dialogue, um, mm -hmm. but that's what you know that's what I was hoping this would do is create this dialogue. Uh, between me as a scientist and and a broader community.
Sorry, it's been such an intriguing story how our ancestors came to stand up and then traipse all over the globe. It's no doubt a very rewarding field of study, and I'm sure there are a lot more pieces of the puzzle that will come to light in the decades to come. So uh, wh what's next for you? A new paper, maybe? A TEDx or uh, perhaps another book in the words? I love all those ideas. I think that's <laughs> great. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're working on a on a paper that describes some of the findings from that uh, expedition to Laetoli. Uh and Laetoli has become quite uh, a magnet for me. And so we'll be returning there when it's safe when it's safe to do so. Um, I'll also be working with with Lee Berger uh, on his new finds um, at a site called the 105 site. Uh, we already have some foot bones that we're beginning to 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 uh, analyze, and so the work continues. Um, really trying to. Uh, uh, you know, discover some of those questions that we still don't have good answers to uh, that, I, that I mentioned towards the beginning of, of why did we start off on this journey on, on two legs and, and what was the tempo and what was the pace and what was sort of the patterning of bipedal evolution uh, through time. Uh, but this, you know, writing this book uh, has, uh, it, it was sort of, you know, addicting the writing uh, and, and I'm ready to do it again. Um, and so, yes, there will be there will be another book. I will leave links to your book and social media in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you very much. And hopefully we can have you back on the show one day in the very near future. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you so much. This was a great conversation. Um, and thank you for all you do to promote science literacy. It's so important uh, right now. So thank you, Mark. Thank you so much.